If you're looking to figure out how Airtable works, or maybe you know that it can do some stuff and you just haven't quite wrapped your head around it, then this is the right video for you. I'm gonna be going into detail about my three top tips for really understanding the fundamental building blocks of Airtable. So stick around and let's get into it. Hey, I'm Gareth Pronovost. I am the owner at Gap Consulting, where we help you to organize and automate your business and life using no-code tools, Airtable at the top of that list. So if you are interested in learning the basic fundamentals of Airtable, as I said in the intro, you are in the right place. This is gonna be the perfect video for you if you are just picking up the software or if you are trying to figure out like how can you get Airtable to do those complex things that you've seen other people do and you just don't really understand the fundamentals of it. So let's just jump right into that. I'm gonna be leading off with my first tip, which is understanding that Airtable is a relational database and not a spreadsheet. Specifically, when using spreadsheets, we tend to create a lot of tabs or new sheets within our workbook there at the bottom of your spreadsheet tool, right? So if you're using Excel or Google Sheets or some other spreadsheet, then it's pretty commonplace for you to just start adding in little tabs and you know expanding the data that you keep. I'll give you an example. I had a client who owned dance studios. He had three different locations and he was collecting data for people who came into the dance studio. So if they went into location one, he had a spreadsheet for that. If they went into location two, he had a second spreadsheet, right? So this is how he like kept his data, but the data inside of the spreadsheet was the same every time. It was just lead contact information. So people would come in, they'd put down their phone number, email address, and this was his way of keeping store of who visited what location so that he could bill appropriately, make sure to follow up with people, etc. This makes total sense if you're using a spreadsheet. Makes total sense to have different spreadsheets for different locations. But when he went to build in Airtable, he was creating a new table for every single one of those locations. And really, he was collecting the same set of data in three different tables, which is a big no-no in database design. So the big tip number one really boils down to when you're using a relational database like Airtable, when you create a new tab, which we call a table inside of database, when you're creating a new table, it represents a set of data. And a set of data is not, you know, contacts who visited one specific location versus contacts who visited another location. No, that's all the same data. That's all contact data and the location that they visit can just be one point of data in each record that you bring in. So rather than creating three separate tables, what I advised him to do was to create one table with contact information and on every record, every person who signed in, you would just say which location they visited. So this is the big difference between spreadsheets and databases. So when building an Airtable, try to think in sets of data. Every data set, in this case, contact information, that is a table that you'll build inside of your database. All right, tip number two comes down to the primary field. Now, again, if you're new to database design, the primary field is the leftmost column in your Airtable database. And this is the visible name field that we have inside of Airtable. Now, the important thing to know about the primary field in Airtable is that the name that you give something is only the visible name from that field. The actual way that Airtable tracks and records the different records is through a record ID. And you can call upon that record ID by using the formula record ID. And so in doing so, you will see that every single record, as soon as it's created, automatically is assigned a record ID. And you know it's a record ID because it always begins with lowercase rec and then has a string of random variables. Now that ID is unique to every single record upon creation. And pro tip, anytime you're building any automation that's going to link one record to another, using the name field is going to get you bad results. But if you link records via automation or through the API, using the record ID, 
you will find great success. So whenever you are referencing records and connecting them either via automation or otherwise, using the record ID will ensure that you always get a unique and proper connection to the record you're looking for. Now, that being said, the primary field, that leftmost field or column, that is the most important field in your database. And for me personally, I would suggest that you follow two rules whenever you go to name that field. I like those two rules to be, I want my name to be something that identifies what lives in this table. And rule number two is, I want that ID or that name to be as unique as possible without going overboard. Now that's a little bit more art than science, but you can always change the name over time and it won't impact anything, especially if you're properly connected using the record ID via automation. Now, going back to that first tip, using something that identifies what lives there. And the second tip, making sure that they are as unique as possible. So if we were to think about contacts again, in a contacts database table, I would expect to see a full name and a last name in the contacts because it tells me who that person is and it's pretty darn unique. It's not 100%, but it's pretty close. Sometimes you might see people using an email field, for example, inside of the primary field. Personally, I don't like that only because I don't think of people as email addresses. So by bringing that email address into the primary field, I don't know who that is when I link to that record. And bear in mind that whatever that name field is, that primary field, whatever you choose there, that's how you're going to see records when you connect records through other table links. So again, following those two rules is really going to help you out when you go to name your primary field. Now tip number three, again, this is to unlock the full potential of Airtable as a newcomer or as somebody who's just adopting the software and trying to understand all of the nuance. Tip number three revolves around views. So a view in Airtable is a specific slice of data. It's a way that you're looking at your table. And again, remember your table is a set of data. And inside of your table, you have a number of different views. You can have any number of views and different types of views from standard grid, which is rows and columns, to Kanban view, to calendar views, form views, Gantt views, you name it. There are a lot of different ways that you can visualize your data. And that is all a view is. It is looking at the same underlying data inside of that table and it's presenting it in, a, in the way that you've designed the view. Now, the really cool thing to know about the views is that you can apply filters and sorts and groups and all kinds of things to each view and it's unique to the view in question. So if you have five different views, they have five different settings. Each of those settings or each of those views can have their own filters, groupings, sortings, etc. And this comes in really handy when you're looking to get a very specific slice of data at a moment's notice. So for example, you might have an onboarding process that is looking for a certain status inside of your projects. So if you tracked your project data and you had an onboard status, well, you could have a view that was dedicated to only filtering in those projects that are currently onboarding. So this is a great way for you to get a quick slice of data so that you can work with exactly the things you need to work with at a moment's notice and not interrupt or in interfere with the overall operations of the business. So I hope that you found those three tips to be really powerful and help you grasp the fundamentals of Airtable. It's an incredibly powerful software and is the back end of all of the no code databases that we build here at Gap Consulting. If you're looking for more help and you really want to level up with your Airtable knowledge, we offer a weekly webinar. It's 100% live and we're going to go through how to build a second brain for your business that runs with Airtable and automations in the back end and helps keep you more organized and way more efficient. If that's of interest, do check the description of this video. I'll include a link to sign up for our webinar so that you can come check it out and really level up your business. In the meantime, thanks for watching and leave a comment below if you have any questions. As always, I hope you found that to be extremely helpful. If you did and you'd like to learn more, swing by our website and see how we can help. 
We offer a free Airtable crash course that will help you level up in Airtable quickly, and we also have some paid services, including hourly consultations with our experts, we have some online courses and a group coaching program, and for advanced needs, we can build a bespoke solution for you from scratch. So swing on by, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.